time I go to grab it to mute it or whatever, and you've already taken the damn thing. Did you take the batteries out of it too? There it goes. All right, got the assault back in. Pretty excited. Every time I bring this thing in, I always kind of like forget how cool it is and how much I like it. So I'm pumped to have this back in. I've got a little bit of a break between customer stuff while I wait for some more parts. So I'm going to go ahead and yank this thing apart, tear it all the way down, and put the billet intake manifold on from Indy Specialty. But some people probably know there's been some issues with the factory one cracking. Uh, it's kind of like a molded plasticky rubber type assembly and they kind of split on the bottom side from what I've seen. So like I said, we're replacing it with this awesome new billet piece from Indy Specialty. They also set me up with the awesome new V-Force Reeds replacement, you know, same deal as the 24s or very similar to what comes in the 24s. I'm gonna go ahead and start tearing this thing down and well, yeah, I got about half an hour before lunch, so get most of it in terms of console and body panels and stuff off of there. And then after lunch, really dig into it. I went with this manifold from Indy Specialty simply because they've been really good to me. I've used a bunch of their products, a couple engines. Their stuff has always performed flawless and I haven't ever had an issue with it. So I figured I would continue on that path and stick with, you know, people that have treated me right. There's probably gonna be some stuff that I don't need to take off, but I'm gonna take off. I'm just gonna blow this thing apart to try and get as much space as possible under here to move stuff around. If anyone watching has done this a couple times already and they're like, hey, you don't need to take that off or whatever. This is my first time doing one of the boost ones. And like I said, I'm blowing this thing apart. So like I kind of mentioned in my 650 video with this main harness here that comes down to this connector, I mean, boop, there we go. And then down to these, on this side runs over, goes to the um, actuator solenoid for the wastegate, down this side, whatever. I'm gonna unplug all of this and move this entire bundle out and up that way. There's a connector buried behind here. I'll undo the coolant jug, which will hopefully give me a little bit more room. But I think I can fish up in here and unplug that one, no big deal. Unplug your fuel pressure sensor and then a couple others over here. And then this whole snarl should pull right out and go up front. And that way I have the most room up top and just everywhere to get this air box out. I think I'm like about one hour into it probably to get it to this point, tank off. Most of the wiring's undone. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. I still gotta pull the clutch so I can get in and pull the clutch so I can get in and get the actual boots off. It's just a lot of stuff. You just gotta take your time and one piece, one piece, one piece, keep repeating until you get everything off of there. One quick thing I do wanna add, when you are doing this or getting to this point where you're starting to unplug a lot of stuff, just take a ton of pictures. Take your phone, open, shout out. Take a bunch of pictures, everything under there. It doesn't matter the angles, just keep snapping them because you can always just go back and delete them but at least then you have them if you're like, oh wait, how does this connector go or where does this zip tie go? You have a million pictures to sort through and check and zoom in on. Just some people don't even think about it. I forget a lot of times too, but on this one, I'm trying to do my best to just take a bunch of pictures. That way, if I need them, I have them, they're there, I have references. This main lower connector is definitely tricky. It's not incredibly difficult, but you wanna take your two eight mils out, move the coolant tank over. You can see there was a Christmas tree uh, push pin here that goes in this hole. I have these on hand. So instead of trying to like fish around back there and push it out with no clearance on the backside, I just cut it with the flush cuts on this side, pushed it through. And then with one hand pulling out on this piece, I use this hand to fish the 
wire between this gap here. You can see how much it moves real easy. So I just grabbed it, pulled that out, pulled the wires over this way. Your connector ends up down here. You can unplug it. And then you have this whole bundle here, which we might as well just do it while we're here. Move that fuel connector, this guy up through here. And these numbers, wow. Did not trip over everything. And then, gently, you know, obviously this is one-handed, but you just kind of do one of these. Grab this whole bundle here. Uh, I'm gonna cut that. Snip. And this can stay over here for now. Yeah, now yeah, check this out. Ton of room, tons of room now. Plenty of room. Like I said, that's, that might be unnecessary, but for the extra, you know, three minutes down in here to pull that out, it frees up just so much space. You have, you know, you gained an inch and a half up here of that main bundle running through here. So I think in the long run, it's just gonna make everything a lot easier. This is a prime example why I don't trust any dealership to touch any of my stuff. In the previous videos, you know, this went in for the oil pump recall. I pull my secondary off. I'm in here getting stuff, you know, all pulled apart for this manifold job. And I'm checking out my seal and whatnot. And I'm looking down in here and I find this. The turbo pump, I know you gotta drill the pan down there and swap the, you know, pump over. And what, like, this is just asinine, man. It's not even like it went to a spot that's hard to find. Imagine if that bounced up into my clutch. I don't wanna talk bad on people, but like, do your damn job, dude. All right, that fun discovery aside, I'm ready to undo the clamps and try to finagle the intake box out of there. I think I'm gonna try and do it with the oil tank still in. Probably won't come out, I'll have to take the tank off anyway, but I'm gonna try. Ah, oil tank still in. So boost air box you can get out without having to remove your oil tank or mess with your oil line. So that's kind of nice. You do need to undo the two lower clamps so that you can get the boot off of the turbo to the inlet. It's just super tight in there. The boot will go back and hit the compressor housing. The other way it goes back and hits the air box. So you gotta move, undo your two clamps here, move the air box back just enough, like that little quarter, half an inch, gets you just enough to go and then pry the boot out of there. It's still a little tight, but it does come out. Now I can go ahead and remove these secondary boots and continue on pulling the rest of the stuff out. get this guy out of the way. Goes to this one here, which goes down to the turbo oil pump and stuff. Why it's through this loop-de-doo here, I don't really know. I feel like that isn't really exactly necessary. Dumb. So yeah, when you get to this point, it's a lot of fun messing around with zip ties and fuel, but the fuel will dry up, so going back together, now that I have this out, I can look at this a little closer and figure out how, ah, fuel down the arm. Get these off of here. Like that. Like that. Got the throttle body assembly out. That really wasn't too, too bad aside from this zip tie contraption that holds one of the oil pump wires that goes down for the turbo oil pump. Other than that, this came out pretty easily. Got everything out, got it all cleaned up here. Kind of like a nice little reset, put some tools away, whatever. I end up doing that a lot where I get into like these big jobs and halfway through I'll just reset everything. Start over, that way I know someone, nope, okay, we're good. That way I know that everything is away and I haven't missed anything. And washed up, got this little fucking cut here. And try to keep it from getting all fuel and whatever. But we're gonna go back together real good because now we got our angry burbs. Little burbs fucking band-aid here. Oh yeah, we can't we can't mess up now. I got this manifold out and I was honestly hoping to find a broken pedal or a couple chipped ones or something drastic. I didn't notice any crazy power loss or anything last year. But you never like, you know, you ride it all year, you kinda get used to things, you get used to the power, it might have slowly tapered off and didn't know it, but I only found one on here that is this guy here. Let me get my camera back. Yep. 
So I don't know if you can, this will focus up or not, but right here, the end of this one pedal is starting to chip. Definitely starting to let go. So it is an issue and this has got 2,400 miles ish, somewhere in that range. I am about two and a half hours, two hours and 40 minutes into it to this point to get it all blown apart. Being that this is my personal sled, I'm hustling a little bit faster than I would be on a customer unit. Um, also, this is the first time, so I'll be a little bit quicker next go around, but there really isn't any way to speed this job up too much other than like just kind of knowing an order of operations, but it's all just one step, one step, one step. There isn't any massive trick to doing this other than just take your time, pull stuff apart. Like I said, take your pictures, label things. That's about it. This part's rough. You gotta get aggressive with this to where you feel like you're gonna break it, pretty much, is what it comes down to. So you take this tool and you insert it. Yeah, this one's still loose. So I got this side crack free. Um, there are tabs in here that have to release and basically you need to wedge this in there hard enough that it separates this enough to pop the thing out. I mean, it takes some force. Uh, it's definitely spooky the first time, but Okay, so that side went real easy once the other one was done. All right, now that made me look really dumb because that wasn't all that spooky. So let's, let's, we're gonna break one free over here. We're gonna do this one for the first try. And I'm just gonna do it on the bench because holding it and trying to do it like the, <laughs> the picture, <laughs> the picture of just doing this, that ain't gonna happen unless you got some bear mitts on you. There we go. So that's definitely the easiest. Get a bench and just bam. That first little bit I tried to do by hand doing the, the pinch method about blew my fingertips off. I just get a bench, towel, and just blast them down. That actually wasn't too, too bad. That first one had me sketched out though. All right, there's that. Cool, made myself look dumb, but you'll have that. So this is the worst one, 2,400-ish miles, somewhere in that range. You can see it's pretty burnt on the end. It's only going to get worse from there. I've got a riding buddy and a customer that's got like 43 or 4,800 miles or something like that on his. I'm curious to get that in and get this same job done and see what his look like. All right, the instructions say to take your screwdriver on a 45 degree angle and pry this pin out. Or you can see this one I got most of the way out. They say to come in from over here and try to pry it. I didn't have any luck doing that on the other one. I ended up coming in this side and uh, just giving it a gentle pry like this, one of these numbers. You know, obviously you don't wanna break that little tab in the center, but that moved it over really easy. And then you can get it on an angle this way and just kind of tap it the rest of the way out until you can get it with your pliers and then slide it right out. up here boy all right when you go to put these uh center reed pedal retainers in there is a direction that they have to go you see the end of this one is closed off the open end has to go in because there are those little tabs see they're slightly raised or they've got a gap on the bottom so the channel of this retainer pin slides in through there and that's what locks into that so yeah make sure you have that pin going the right way and then when you get to your top ones here, you can see the slots line up and then you press them down. They have that little click, click action to them as that rectangle seats into the actual pedal. And that way they kind of self retain a little bit so you can put it back into the cage without having to worry about them getting twisted or shuffled around. Pretty nice. They actually, they go together pretty damn good. The only really sketchy part was using the tool here to press them out of the main cage. That takes some force. I think you'd have to have some really, really old and brittle ones for that to break anything, but 
that's their tool. That's the way they're meant to be done. Another tip worth talking about here. If you look through, a lot of these new ones are allegedly coming through with a gap on the center pedals. You can see the outsides are pretty damn good. It's reported a bunch of times that these new updated ones have a little bit of an air gap in the center here. So granted, I'm holding them up directly at a light. See, it's not as bad there. And you go up to the light, still whatever. You got the gap. Allegedly, a credit card is too much of a gap. A sheet of paper is roughly acceptable. And as you can see... I can barely, if I go from like the corner and kind of slide it in there, I can get the paper in. But if I try to go right from the center, the paper will not go into there. Same deal on that one. If you go from the edge, I can kind of get it and slide it in there. But just going from the middle, it doesn't. So these are allegedly acceptable. If you do this and you run into that, don't be alarmed. See like this one's really good. So there is definitely some discrepancies and tolerances across the board, but you'll have that. Oh, I have tried flipping the pedals as well. Um, I've tried moving the little lock retainers back and forth to try and take any tension out. Flipping didn't really change it at all. Just this cage and this pedal assembly has a little bit more of a gap than the other one. But allegedly from reports and people that have called Moto Tassinari, this is normal on this. Once they go through a couple heat cycles and settle, they will remain flat. So. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and throw it together. This thing's coming right along. As you can see, the air intake box is back in there. The billet manifold's on and torqued. The uh, throttle bodies are on, fuel lines are hooked up, the two coolant lines. Most of the hard stuff basically is all set and done. Now it's just gonna be a matter of throwing the wiring and stuff on tomorrow, fuel tank. The little stuff, you know, the last 20% type thing that is just probably gonna drag on a little bit, but it won't be that bad. I'm pumped, this went pretty well. There wasn't anything major that stood out of like, oh, this was really tough to do or tricky. It was all kind of just step by step, just a lot of pieces and a lot of parts to take off, a lot of connectors. You just gotta take the time to go ahead and do it. Moving forward, I think tomorrow, since I have this all blown apart already, there's some gearing stuff I wanna change. I tried a few different ratios last year and I ended up with one right now that I, I'm not thrilled with. It's very close to what I was running, but it's not what I was running. So I'm gonna go back to what I know works. I'm gonna use different size gears. I've got a couple different ones. Not aluminum, for anyone thinking that route. Uh, I've got a couple different gears to try and reduce some weight and play with sizes, but use the same overall ratio that I ran in the middle of last year that I liked better than what is currently in it. So while it's all blown apart, I'm gonna go ahead and do that tomorrow. But that's gonna be it for tonight. It's almost seven o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna go get some food and Probably start editing the first half of this and we'll pick it back up tomorrow morning. Jesus, what'd you do, fall down? <laughs> One job. <laughs> Tighten up now. <laughs> I'm there I go. Dude, that is sketch. It's all blocked. Oh, you got it blocked. Yeah, it's not too bad, I guess. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to fucking move tomorrow. <laughs> You gotta put a hat on, dude. You're gonna be bumping your noggin all over. Sure. So where all my hair went. All right, so <laughs> he beat me out here by quite a bit today. But uh, we're gonna go on on this thing again. We're gonna try to anyway. Get this all buttoned up back together. Okay, we're good for a minute here. I totally botched yesterday. I did the wrong time-lapse setting and stuff. So it's gonna, you'll notice a difference between yesterday and today because I, I dropped the ball on that one. But it all still worked out. It covers most of it, so my bad.
I'm gonna go ahead, while this is all apart right now, it's easier than with everything together, obviously, to go ahead and change my chain case gearing and stuff. I think While I'm blasting this chain case apart and switching all that, I also have to throw brake pads in this thing because these ones are cooked. I feel like that's a pretty good indication of how hard someone rides. You know, if you're like, oh, I ride really hard, but you've never once ever put a set of brake pads in a sled, you're not riding that hard, bud. Pushing the pistons back and you want to go from top and from the bottom you have to move this piston back like uniform it has to be parallel if it gets crooked at all it will not retract you're going to fight that thing and it won't be a fun time also don't forget you got to take your cap off up here and this is what's been pushed back you can see how nasty and burnt this stuff is i usually flush my brake fluid a couple times a season as you guys can kind of see i'm really hard on the brake but this is what it pushed back up through nasty dirty filthy stuff. So as you push the pistons back, you know, keep your eye on that. I end up just taking the rag and soaking that up in there. If you end up soaking it all the way out and then you pull the lever, you could get air into the master. So I don't usually go too crazy with it. I get the level most of the way down. You can see these are most of the way back right now. I'm probably gonna do a test fit with the rotor and everything on here. I found if you push them all the way back, sometimes it's hard to get them to expand all the way back out to the pad and hold that and you end up with a little bit of extra free play until you do some heat cycles and stuff it can be kind of tricky most of the time it goes back together pretty well but i have had some of them fight me as far as the brake pads go i'm using these sp1 full metallic ones uh, i have not used them before this is going to be my first time using these things so we're going to give them a shot the factory ones held up pretty good i would love to end up doing you know like the cross-country floating rotor and the crazy hd pads but it's quite expensive so I'm just going to try these things out and see how they go. I'm bleeding these brakes out and uh, fluid's not supposed to be this color. And this doesn't have very many miles on it, probably a thousand. Like I said, I do it multiple times a season, especially on a boost with all the exhaust heat and everything right there. It just bakes the brake master, the chain case, all this stuff over here just gets so much more heat than an NA model. It's a good idea if you guys have one of these to go ahead and add this to a more regimented service plan than just once a season. Pretty much back to where I was before I dug into the gearing and whatnot. That turned out to be a fiasco. Some dude on eBay got me. The 13 wide chain I ordered is actually a 15, so I could not use the gear that I wanted to or the ratio I wanted to. So I went back with a setup that will be fine for now, and then when I get more motivation mid-season, I'll order the right chain and pull it apart and do what I wanted to do. But we're back to that point now, so now I can go ahead and slam this thing back together. Uh, gas tank, cowling, a little bit of wiring left, nothing major, just the ECU and whatnot. So I'm gonna go ahead and knock all that stuff out and then fire this thing up. Beat. It's been a long couple days of work and then this thing. 
Boy, she's dusty. There's a there's way more dust and little bits of like rust from water sitting than should be on this because it's been in the brand new trailer the whole summer. So I don't know if when it went in for work it sat outside or it sat on a rack below other sleds that were wet or something. But yeah, I'm very suspicious of a few things, but that's neither here nor there. It should be all set to fire up. Uh, I'm gonna do that right now and then I'm gonna go eat because I'm kind of over it. You know, over being in the shop. Let's see. Gauge work still. Battery's kind of weak. I'm sitting here editing this manifold video and get to the last clip of starting the sled up after doing all the work and realize the GoPro battery died like 35, 40 seconds into that outro clip of the sled running and stuff like that. So I'm doing a little outro here. And all in all, the job isn't incredibly difficult. It is very time consuming. And I guess depending on your level of mechanical knowledge, it could be very difficult, right? It's a time consuming job to do start to finish and do it right and take your time and pull it apart. Like I said, I probably pulled it apart a lot more than I had to, but I wanted it to go as easy as possible and it definitely did. So yeah, that's gonna do it for this one. Uh, I've got some other stuff in the pipeline. There's some more dually content coming, which did not really take off very well, but I'm assuming that's mostly based off of the YouTube algorithm and homepage stuff. So if you guys are interested in an old 80s dually with a massive turbo on it, things like that, go check those videos out. There'll be more coming, but yeah, that's gonna wrap this one up. Yeah.